um, uh, making sure that the tech and, and the introduction was so wonderfully presented. My name is Erin Weber Johnson, as indicated. I am the Program Director for Strategic Resources. Um, and before that, I, I worked in um, capital campaign and annual giving fundraising. I spent a lot of time thinking about why do people give. Uh, and so tonight, we're going to talk about the basics of annual giving, really looking at what are the strategies that we know actually work. Now, the Episcopal Church Foundation has been around for almost 60 years, and we provide resources um, to parishes specifically so that they will be empowered to live more fully into their mission. And this is our, our uh, mission statement. Now, it's important for me to, to talk about this early on because I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about the why, the why of why do people give to your organization, why do people give generally. This is the why as to why the Episcopal Church Foundation provides our resources. This is who we are, our identity, and, and what we seek to accomplish. So tonight, this is what you can expect from me. This is what we will cover. We will cover the why. We will cover a potential year-round ca uh, campaign calendar. Excuse me. We'll walk through changes in giving trends. I'll speak in a short bit about how to reach different ages and commitment levels. And then we'll end uh, on the role of gratitude and fun. I want to say one more time, if at any point you have a question, feel free to use this chat box to your right and type in a question. I'm happy to answer at any point. Now, at this point, what I'd like to do is to begin by saying I'm going to be pulling in a number of different resources. Some are specifically, have been created specifically by the Episcopal Church Foundation or by me. And then others are items that I've seen out in the world that I think that you could benefit from. And the first is uh, specifically the Simon Sinek TED Talk. And I'm going to ask that that um, link be made available to you. What I'm going to ask is, this TED Talk is actually 15 minutes long, but there's one segment of about a minute that I would like you to, to take this moment and watch. You'll see the link in the chat box to your right. So what I want you to do is to either copy and paste and put that in your browser, or try and click on that and access that through your web browser. And watch that particular TED Talk from 2.15 to 3.30. I'm going to allow for some free time for us to do that for about a minute or so for you to be able to pull that up and then watch. Now, when you have completed watching, what I'd, I'd appreciate it is if, uh, yes, I see the TED history has returned. Um, you'll see that we've cleared it and then just brought up that particular link. You should be able to utilize it now. Um, feel free to watch it, and then when you have finished watching it, post in the chat that you have completed. And then that way I am prompted to be able to continue with the webinar. Thanks, Ted. I'll give you all just about one and a half minutes to watch.
Just a reminder, when you've finished, feel free to let me know in the chat box. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> Good. All right. It looks like we're starting to finish up. Following this webinar, if you would like, feel free to watch the rest of the Simon Sinek TED Talk. It's a wonderful resource, I think, for all areas of our ministry life. But what I like particularly about this piece is that oftentimes with annual campaigns, we can get really caught up in the how, the what should our campaign theme be, or what should our uh, ministry moment really focus on. And, we, and, and strategies are important, but they have to be rooted at the very beginning in something that is compelling, something that is life-giving, the why. And the why can never, ever be because you need to balance your budget. The why can never be that you need to give to a particular parish, because if you don't, the sky will fall in. People will give to you in the short term, but in the long term, donor fatigue begins to set in. <coughs> if we believe that fundraising is ministry, then what we are doing is, through annual giving, we are providing them, our parish, the people that we love, our community of faith, with a particular gift. This ministry is as important as any other ministry that's found in the parish. If we believe that fundraising is ministry, then this becomes the why, because when we offer people an opportunity to give to an annual campaign, we're not just asking people to give for our Excel budget, our Excel spreadsheet. Rather, we're offering them the opportunity to give to the kingdom of God, to invest their resources. And there becomes this space within that conversation for conversion, for transformation. I like to tell this story. So I was uh, doing a, an annual giving um, training with a church. And one of the, the pieces that we were working with was how do you have a conversation with someone else face to face and invite them to join you in giving? And I must tell you, all that have gathered here for this webinar, I was actually getting the stink eye um, from one of our beloved members of <laughs> of this parish. She was looking at me this entire time really dubiously, uh, and, and I, I think in some ways kind of critically, because she had had negative experiences with being asked to give. And I laid out the same framework that I'm going to lay out to you all tonight about asking um, people to join us in giving. And she said, I don't know if I like this, but I'm going to give it a shot. And two weeks later, I got a phone call from Sharon, and she was crying. And Sharon was saying, I never knew that it could be like this. What she found through the process of asking people to give to her parish, to God, for their faith, was that she found a greater connection to her own faith. But also, there was this connection of, of belonging. She really was able to see that this became a ministry. Now, I see on the chat box, Jeanette, that you are experiencing serious reverb. Oftentimes, if you mute your computer, if you are called in using the phone, that will help with any type of additional reverberations. So I want to talk a little bit more about the why. I like to begin any type of annual campaign 
rooted in both a theology as well as a prayer. And this is one of the most beautiful prayers I've ever encountered for an annual giving prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, with the great dynamos and birth giving of your power, you have pulled life from death, freedom from imprisonment, wakefulness from sleep, and action to action. Help us to do the work of leadership and stewardship and financial development. Help us to pull a sleepy people weighed down by sleepy distraction and heavy greed into a generous wakefulness of gratitude and mission investment by helping them give their money away. Help us to set free a church too often confined in the coffins of scarcity so that all saints may work to unfurl the kingdom of God. Amen. I encourage the leadership to create a stewardship prayer that is utilized in all of your campaign materials, in your letters, utilized in your Sunday morning worship, in your planning meetings, and in your one-to-one -one conversation. Now, I have been asked before, and I take this very ser seriously, do we pray, pray these prayers as an act of, say, prosperity gospel? Do we pray these prayers so that we will be successful? And the answer to that is always another question, which is, so what is your definition of success? Is success for you at the end of this annual giving or your fall drive to meet a particular goal? Perhaps absolutely in part, and that is great. But another piece of success could be that you have grounded many of your parishioners in a theology of the why, of why giving is important. And if that is part of your success, then this stewardship prayer becomes a wonderful reminder of why we're doing this ministry, why it's important. So we do pray this prayer to be successful, to accomplish that particular goal. One of uh, the leaders in fundraising right now is, is a gentleman, uh, a priest, by the name of Charles Lafon. And Charles Lafon uh, both wrote that prayer that I just read, and then as well has uplifted this particular icon as a wonderful visual that can be utilized in, in a campaign. And I like to bring lots of different resources and grounding any type of campaign into a theology. And this particular icon is known as uh, the resurrection icon. Um, it's from the seventh century. And where, what you see here in particular is Jesus, and he's reaching down, um, and he grabs uh, that ease that he's holding, and he's watched by Abel and Moses and Peter and John the Evangelist and James. And then you've got... Um, the personification of evil is, is who he's also holding. And it's this idea that all that Jesus is engaging all in this work of creation. And I think that that is a beautiful representation of what stewardship can be, this idea of grabbing people from perhaps a sleepful existence into an exciting new work of ministry. This is a very compelling why. Now, we at the Episcopal Church Foundation often utilize Henry Nowen's book, The Spirituality of Fundraising. And in it, there is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a theology that's laid out that's very accessible. And I often like to highlight this book as a great book to prepare all of your volunteers for fundraising. Excuse me. One of the quotes found and the first chapter of the spirituality of fundraising is this. When fundraising is done right, the person asking and the person giving come together to participate in this new thing that God is doing. So once we are grounded in the why, then we are ready to do a real quick 101 on what is annual giving. Because churches rely on three separate forms of giving for their overall financial health. The first is the one we're going to focus on tonight, which is annual giving. This is regular monthly giving that could come from a person's 
regular monthly income, their regular cash flow. This is tied specifically to the current mission and ministry of the church. Now, the Episcopal Church Foundation also provides resources and capital fundraising as well. And capital campaigns are very important to the life of a, a parish as well. And these are related to specific projects, quite often building projects or endowments. Donors will often give of their assets or from extraordinary sources of fundraising. And this is tied to the future. This is where we ask, what is God calling a parish to be and to do? And then what are the resources necessary for that vision to, to be accomplished? Then finally, we have planned giving. And the Episcopal Church Foundation provides resources in both planned giving and in endowment. This is to fund perpetual activities. This is where a person provides for uh, a legacy within a church and often will come from a, a parish's will or estate plan. It's tied to the continuation of mission in your parish. Now tonight, we are specifically focusing on annual giving. The number one strategy that I can uplift to you all is to not wait until fall to begin your planning. So oftentimes, we often think about the annual campaign, and we, we only think about it from September to December. But the most successful campaigns are the ones that actually look like this iceberg here to the left, where the planning, the pieces that you can see, are the majority of the work of the campaign. And the, then the top of the piece, that is what you see in the fall. These are the visual elements. Now, in your planning, it's very important to be, to be able to have measurable objectives. What are measurable objectives? Oftentimes I'll talk to a parish and I'll say, okay, so what is your goal? And what they will say to me is, we want to raise money. And I think that that's really important. But how do you know if your strategy has been successful from year to year? How can you measure where you're seeing points of connection with your parish and where there are places where you need growth. And that's why you need measurable objectives. And let me give you some examples of what those could be. I was working with a parish in Wisconsin, and one of the things that they wanted was they wanted to see an increase of new pledges. And so they made a goal that said, we would like to see 25 new pledging units this year. I was working with another parish that wanted to see uh, an increase of overall pledges, but wanted it to be specific. So they said, we would like to see 15 of our pledging units increase their pledge by 15%. Very measurable goals that you are able to then, at the end of the year, to go back and say, OK, this is where we hit the mark. And this is perhaps where we need to spend some time looking at different ideas. Now, I want to uh, take one moment and say thanks to Brendan and Miguel. I had noted the, the spirituality of fundraising booklet, which is an item that we use at the Episcopal Church Foundation. They have provided a link for that uh, to the right. So if you would like to learn more about that, please feel free to use that link. Now, when you are in the midst of, of planning, you begin with measurable objectives because that tells you where you want to go. Then you can begin to create a plan. And this plan needs to be concrete. It needs to have a list, list of dates of completion and names of those that are held responsible for completion. Now, this is a master planning document that can be used for a small church or a large church. It can be revised. You can add items from year to year. It is both the plan and it is archive. Why do we need to have this articulated? I'm often told, well, we've done the same thing from year to year. We know what we're doing. 
And the answer to that is when you want to recruit new volunteers, often it can be very overwhelming. If you're a new volunteer going into a position and you're not aware of how things have been done, by documenting your plan, by documenting your task list and your objectives from year to year, you provide an archive for others that are stepping into perhaps your position or new positions to know what's been done and what they can expect to do. All right, I'm going to pause for a moment and ask, are there any questions? And as we wait for those, I'll just, uh, again, remind everyone to use the chat box to type in your questions or if you are on the phone or have your microphone working uh, if you're not already on mute uh, you can uh, go ahead and use that or if you're on mute just let us know we can unmute you to ask that live well perhaps we'll go ahead and move on but uh, if you do have any questions, go ahead and enter those in the chat box. If Aaron doesn't uh, have the ability to catch those right away when you ask them, we'll uh, definitely uh, make sure that we'll flag it for her when we get to another pause uh, or point to take a break. Thank you. I'm really grateful to have a team. It makes this so much easier. Thank you very much. So today, many of the resources uh, that we're going to discuss come from a collaborative initiative, and that's called Pre Project Resource. And for more information on this, you can actually um, click on the link that I've provided. The Project Resource is a training program for all dioceses, and it was a collaborative initiative um, by three particular entities of the Episcopal Church. There was the Development Office of the Episcopal Church, there's the Episcopal Church Foundation, which is where Miguel and Brendan and I work for, and then there was the College of Bishops. And to date, this is actually the first time that such a collaboration has existed. And over the past two years, we've trained up 20 dioceses in annual giving and major uh, gifts as well as planned gifts. If your diocese has participated, terrific. If not, I absolutely uh, uh, would invite your diocese to participate. However, all of the materials found online are specifically and intentionally not copyrighted. This is our gift to the Episcopal Church at large, which means there are hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of pages of templates and resources, everything from your campaign letter to how do you invite volunteers to participate to how do you have a particular conversation with a major donor. These are all found on there. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. And there is no fee to access this information. So I would suggest that if at some point you say, gosh, you know, I would like to do X, Y, and C that you suggested, but I, I sure would like to know a template, I'd like to see what others have done, I would check out Project Resource. And much of what I'm going to be using tonight will come from that. So what I wanted to do tonight was to create a bit of a timeline. Uh, this way you have a sense of, of what you could be doing um, all the way throughout the year. Now, I'd like to begin in January. And January is a great time to begin the important ministry of thank you. The best practice in nonprofits for providing thank yous is to thank each particular donor seven times throughout the year in seven different types of ways. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean seven intentional thank you cards. That can come in a variety of different ways. That can come with um, after the choir sings a beautiful song on a Sunday morning, the choir director saying uh, in a very quick moment, um, it's because of all of you and your generous donations that we're able to have a beautiful choir anthem. Thank you. That's a great thank you opportunity, and it's a great chance to connect mission with potential donors. 
I have seen a thank you take place with um, children's ministry creating a video and says, thank you for your generous gift last year. It's because of your gift that we're able to have this awesome ministry. You can get creative in your thank yous. But January is a great way to kick off gratitude. Acknowledge last year's gift. Send out those acknowledgement letters and begin those thank, those thank you phone calls and notes. Remember that there's not an end to stewardship. Stewardship happens all year round. And so the way in which you thank your donors from this year's campaign is going to impact next year's campaign. How people feel that they have been treated impacts their willingness to give in the future. In February, this is a great opportunity to begin volunteer recruitment. I believe that because fundraising is a ministry, that there is a, a, a way in which we ask people if they're feel, feeling called to this particular ministry or calling. So Frederick Buechner has this great quote where, the place where the world's great need and your deep hunger meet, that's part of your vocation. This also then provides a path for an ACE recruitment system. What I like to talk a lot about with volunteerism, especially for annual giving, is I like to ask the question, how much do you think a volunteer's hour is worth? Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually keeps um, a statistical analysis on this. They, they take the average of all different regions in the area, and they factor in different professionalizations, and they come up with a number each year for what a volunteer hour is worth. And in 2015, that number was not minimum wage. It was not $17. It was not $20. No, this was $24. A volunteer hour is worth $24, which is really amazing when you think of how many volunteer hours go into just having worship on Sunday morning. And so when you think about recruiting for stewardship, I like to start thinking about who are the people that you want, but then also thinking about how can we – best use their gifts knowing that their time is worth so much. One of the first ways in which you can um, provide a responsible framework uh, for any volunteer position is to create a job description. Now this is a sample job description. I just am showing it in its full form so that you can see it looks like any other job description. And this comes from St. John the Evangelist. Um, and then I have narrowed in on one particular piece of this. This is sample text for a, a volunteer description for an annual giving volunteer. It says, for the annual pledge campaign, with the assistance of the rector and executive committee, the stewardship chair is asked to, possess, to assume primary responsibility for, and it lists each of these items. This is a great way in which you can communicate exactly what's expected in February and for people to be able to prayerfully consider if they're called to this ministry. It means that no one jumps in not knowing exactly what is being asked of them. So for volunteer recruitment, create a clear time frame. I have articulated expectations through that job description. Think about intergenerational leadership. Oftentimes, the, the donors that you are going to be seeking um, come from particularly diverse generations. And so being able to represent that within the leadership is going to be important. Think about skill-based, not what you need. In March and April, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for a creative conversation. Now, Steeped in this theology of the why, you can begin then to talk about what is your design, your theme of the content, 
You can create your timeline and schedule for the campaign. This is where the nuts and bolts take place. I would also then make sure that you have very accurate lists in March of who your previous donors were um, and think about how those potential donors in the next year might be impacted um, through either a one-on-one -on -one conversation or having a different method of being approached. And then this is a great time. If your vestry or your bishop's committee currently does not have this expectation, it's important then to give them some, some heads up, a few months heads up, that you will be expecting early pledges as an act of leadership and modeling. It's nice to, because we all have our own budgets and we need to be able to plan for that accordingly, to let them know three or four months in advance that this might be something new that you're doing, that in advance of the campaign you will expect all to participate. Now, do all uh, have the same capacity to give? No. And we know at the Episcopal Church Foundation that the widow's might is just as important as the king's ransom in the kingdom of God. All gifts are going to be important for a campaign to be successful. But yet, as an act of leadership, it's important for all to show an investment into your parish's wellness. Uh, Ted Reed asks, is there a generic job description for most positions? And certainly uh, for stewardship, I have a sample that I would be happy to share with you if you would like, Ted. Um, that's always very helpful for any volunteer to, uh, to have a job description. In May, I like for us to do a reflective exercise. But I, I like to do that not just for the leadership then to have a chance to see what works, but then to communicate impact of giving. So what I like to do is to have leadership write an article and publish. How, was, how did the last campaign go? And be honest about it. You don't need to put a happy bow on it. This is your chance to say, you know, we met these particular goals last year, and this is what we learned from that, and this is how we might do things differently. What went well? What was funded? What was the impact of that gift? Was there some new initiative that took place, or is there a new ministry that started in your parish that you'd like to highlight? Why was their gift valuable? That's what people want to know. Why was that gift valuable, both from a spiritual sense and a programmatic sense? This is also important. This is where the first quarter collections take place. People want to know quite often of me, uh, is it, is it uh, possible to expect that every person is going to be able to live into their pledge? And quite simply, since 2008, the answer to that is no. There will be levels of attrition that are varying. But a way to cut down on attrition, a way to, to cut down on people not paying into their pledge, is to provide as much communication early on and in an ongoing way as possible. So providing first quarter a collection note just to say, hey, you pledged this, and this is how much we've received, gives people that early, ah, aha, that's right. So that way they don't fall so far behind that it becomes almost impossible to catch up. This is also a great chance to send a thank you letter uh, to people, once again reminding them of how their gifts have been used. This is where you can begin case materials production. It's not too early in May and June to do this because summer can kind of uh, shape your volunteers' ability to, to participate. May is a great time to think about producing your materials. And then start brainstorming possible ministry minute speakers. Develop a list and refine. And what I like to suggest for this is to really think about a diversity of ministry minute folks, those folks that stand up on a Sunday morning. Think about um, are there a variety of different program areas you'd like to highlight? Or has your parish just finished perhaps a strategic um, plan or a strategic thinking session where you've highlighted different core values? Um, you could have mission moments highlighted different you uh, on a Sunday morning. Or perhaps your parish wants to highlight the fact that you have great diversity in generations. So 
one Sunday you have a greatest generation person stand up, and the next you have a, a millennial, and the next you have a generation Xer. Or perhaps you want to highlight different programmatic areas. So you have a choir member speak on a Sunday morning, and then you have a Sunday school teacher, or you have a recipient of some of those ministries speak. Think about a way in which you can show the totality of your parish's um, life in front of those. This is a great chance to bring life to how people are, are, are giving of their funds. In June and July, this is where your ministry minute speakers are recruited. Now, I have seen folks use as many as eight speakers and as few as four, and that is absolutely adaptable to your context and I trust that you know your folks well. I have found that sometimes people really enjoy hearing from their peers as to why they chose to give, and it can be exciting. What I would suggest is no matter what you do, make sure you have some understudies that are waiting in the wings that are able to, to jump up in case of illness or unexpected absence. I like to suggest that after your collection has taken place that you have a phone-a-thon. And I'll talk a bit about collection in, in a few months here, but uh, make sure in June and, and July that you have um, some folks that are lined up to do a phone-a-thon. This is a great way to do a catch-all at the end of an annual campaign so that if you know that there are some folks that give every year but have not submitted that pledge card, you have a vehicle, a technique, a strategy where perhaps you join everybody uh, together on a Sunday afternoon or a Wednesday evening and you order some pizza and you have some fun prizes for those who finish their calls. But you can make this a real fun event, but make sure you create one more uh, way in which people are asked to give. Then you plan your capital, excuse me, plan your campaign special events. You have a kickoff. You may throw a party if you'd like, or it could be a potluck. But one way to signal that, that the campaign has begun. Make sure you have a fine timeline. This is the beginning of your annual giving fall drive, and this is the end. And you're able to communicate that, both to the volunteers so that they know what's required of them, and to those in your parish. Um, people are often skeptical these days of, of the campaign that goes on and on and on and on. And so letting them know what they can expect is a great way to build trust in the process. In June and July, this is where your second quarter um, collections, your thank you letters go out. You don't have to send this letter out for collections to paid pledgers, though I would recommend sending out a, another thank you letter. You cannot thank these folks enough. In August, this is where you have your campaign direct mail warm-up letters. This is not the ask. You do not rely specifically on one letter for your invitation. And you might ask me why. The reason is, so uh, there is, the Chronicle of Philanthropy has published numerous studies around just this particular piece. And what ha they have found time after time is that if you send out a letter, you can expect a response rate of about 1 to 3%. If you have a one-to-one -one conversation and you are a nonprofit, just a nonprofit, you can expect a response rate of, depending on the year in which you look at the study, anywhere between 20 to 25 percent. And if you are a faith-based organization, that number doubles. It's very important for people of faith to join one another face-to-face -face in community and make this invitation. This is where, in August, you recruit your phone-a-thon callers. You continue your planning. In September, this is where you have your draft of weekly notices. So those items that go in the uh, bulletin announcements, 
that um, your announcements on a Sunday morning, you make sure you craft those in advance. You, you can always connect those with your ministry moments. Oftentimes what I've done is I've actually created a template for ministry moments saying, okay, uh, here is our stewardship prayer. I'd like you to begin with that stewardship prayer um, and then spend two minutes covering these particular points. And then I follow up with having an announcement from another individual saying, as this individual in the ministry moment said, these particular items are important to us, and I invite you to give. Repeating the same message throughout in a variety of different vehicles. This is where the a campaign brochure and pledge card is sent through direct mail. Um, this is where you can uh, send um, expectations for those that will be on your phone-a-thon, um, and in September is where traditionally you have a kickoff event. October, uh, this is where ministry moments take place. This is where your third quarter collections and letters go out because it's the, we're getting close to the end of the year. We want to make sure people are on top of their previous year pledges. Um, the kickoff takes place and with the menu, the volunteers, event plan, and budget. Now, Jeanette, you've asked a great question. If the warm-up letter does not have the invitation, what does it actually include? The warm-up letter includes the why. The warm-up letter talks about why giving to the parish is important. It describes the timeline so that people have realistic expectations of, of, of what's going to take place, um, when they will be specifically asked to give, when their pledge card will be due, what will happen if the pledge card is not submitted. And, and I don't mean that punitively, but rather, if you uh, are not able to um, fill out your pledge card, then we will be doing a phone-a-thon for the last three weeks of November. So that way people know what to expect. So we have the kickoff in October, and then we have thank you letters. I often actually like to have volunteers that are set aside specifically for the thanking ministry. Because there are generations for whom time is of actual critical importance. So for example, I like to suggest that if you have say someone from a, a millennial generation who provides a pledge, that you have a way in which they are thanked within 24 hours of that pledge. Sometimes you'll have people who will say, I, I am very much committed to stewardship at our church, but I, I'm still feeling a little nervous about um, making an invitation. This is a great chance for mentorship uh, and formation, to bring them on board as volunteers, have them participate in the thanking part of the, the campaign, and once they experience how this connects um, and they experience invitations that are not um, uh, high-pressured salesman pitches but authentic and life-giving, then they can perhaps take on an additional responsibility in subsequent years. Thank you notes need to be sent out as soon as possible. Um, I often like to have two different types of notes. One is a note that reviews the terms of their pledge. That way, this is their confirmation of what they have pledged. And if there are any discrepancies, this is your chance to make sure that they're taken care of before that operating budget is created for the next year. And then I like to have a separate thank you letter, say, from the campaign chair or from one of your thank you volunteers or from the rector, um, thanking them for their important gifts and for their um, gift to the kingdom of God. Separating the two is a great way to get two thanks. In November, you have a celebration event. Now, the celebration event does not need to be large. I had a really sweet parish that um, 
was so delighted that they broke the $100,000 mark on their annual giving uh, measurable goal that they went out and they bought 100 grand candy bars. I had another parish that was so excited that at the end of their campaign, they passed out red hot because they were excited that they were going to be able to pay their heating bills. Like, there are wonderful creative ways in which you can celebrate a successful campaign that can reflect what's of importance to your parish. Make sure that in November you have a chance to have a Sunday where you dedicate those pledges on a Sunday morning. You consecrate the act of your giving. In November, you can start to create year-end letters. Uh, these year-end letters are that one last opportunity, uh, uh, one last invitation for those that maybe made their pledge, but then are looking at their end-of-the-year tax opportunities and saying, well, maybe we can give an additional gift. And then fourth quarter um, collections. Make sure that for all the volunteers that have donated their time, that there is a way to have recognition of that. So perhaps on the same Sunday that you um, create space in the Sunday morning to, to thank uh, God for those um, blessings of the pledges. Perhaps you also include a thank you to all volunteers as well. In December, this is a chance for assessment. This is where we look back at those measurable goals and we say, okay, what worked? What didn't? Where do we need to employ different strategies? Collect all the planning information create a binder, create duplicates of that for future volunteers, and organize for the next year. All right, are there any questions before we move on? Uh, you know, I, yeah, go ahead. Yes, and thanks, Erin. And uh, again, invite everyone to uh, type your questions into the chat box. Uh, if you would like to join us uh, audibly, if you're connected on your phone or you know your uh, microphone's working, go ahead and raise your hand. There's a little icon uh, at the top of your screen to do that. But there was earlier, Erin, a question about goals. Um, and there's yes. a question about, do you suggest sharing the uh, goal with the parish? And invited folks to weigh in. I know one. Uh, a person, Daniel, I believe, shared that they do publish that every year, and would just love to hear a bit more from your experience about uh, when the committee sets a goal, how, how or uh, why they should share that or not. Absolutely. I am a big proponent for transparency and as much communication as possible. And so absolutely sharing goals is something that I would highlight. I noticed uh, there was a great suggestion about including that goal, including that, breaking that down with a narrative budget. And that's a great opportunity to do that. What, what is a narrative budget? Um, a narrative budget is where you take your, your regular operating expenses and you categorize it either by program area or by ministry area or by core value, depending on, on what would work for your parish. Um, and it takes things that are sometimes rather hard to grasp, like rather nebulous, like um, building usage or heating bills, and it breaks it out over different program areas so people can see exactly how their gifts are used. Because it can be somewhat um, uncompelling perhaps, to know that you are giving to uh, a parish's um, garbage pickup. But if you know that um, overall operating expenses uh, for the building, you know, 17% of the operating expenses goes to children's ministries, then you know that 17% of your gift is being used in that way. And so it's a great way in which to uplift gifts in concrete ways. And then to tie that to the initial question um, of measurable goals. So perhaps one very concrete measurable goal for your parish would be, if you haven't created a narrative budget this year is, we would like to create a narrative bu a budget and, uh, and provide that additional information. 
Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, there was also a question about the, uh, the, the I guess, the uh, outline that you had for job descriptions as well as the uh, timeline. Is I know we'll provide a copy of the slides. Everyone can download that right now or uh, later. But do you have this in document form or document that you can we can send out to participants in this webinar? I am happy to provide a sample job description. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll definitely make sure that gets out to everyone who's participating in tonight's webinar. And then oh. Terry just put in a question about that, uh, see, this is Dreevy working on a campaign, but what if they are just starting? Uh-huh. That's great. So what you can do then is um, start to, you can absolutely do your planning now. Um, make measurable goals for September and October, um, and then begin from what you learned this fall and begin that planning in January. So there will be a piece of this that has to be truncated, absolutely. The one thing I would suggest that you not do is to not sacrifice the why. Always begin with the why, move to measurable objectives, and then create your strategies. Oftentimes we can get so hung up on strategies in the beginning that we lose the reason for why we're doing what we're doing. So begin there. And if you need to leave some of the strategies that I've outlined um, for next year, that's fine. Do what you can do this year. But start with the why, then goals, and then move to what you can do. Now, I'm going to, because we have about five minutes left, I am going to move real quickly through a few items. So in 2014, about $358 billion were made uh, in terms of gifts to nonprofits. One of the things that I like to talk very briefly about is why do people give? And something to think about is that the language with which you use is important. And so oftentimes we can get caught up in the language of if everyone would just do their part or if everybody would just do what they should, we would not have problems. And certainly that language is compelling to a particular demographic uh, of your parish. But there are some other folks in the pews that perhaps that might not jive with. And if we think about fundraising and ministry, then we can begin to think about it as what is it that other people need or what, what is the invitation that they need to hear in order to be able to give? Because ultimately, if, if we're asking them to give, that's a gift in and of itself. So be mindful of other generations that perhaps have a distrust of institutions that aren't motivated by impact so that narrative budget is important. And think in terms of results. So I described earlier a mission-based budget, a narrative budget. When you are reviewing your slides after this webinar, this is a great how-to to make a mission-based budget. This is an example of a mission-based budget. This breaks down the budget into four pieces, worship, faith formation, social justice, outreach, diocesan pledge, and then the rest. Make sure that you are in the midst of all of this, making your campaign as personal as possible, because money is personal. You know, if you were to look at my, at my own check account, you would see my values and priorities. You would see that the majority of my, my um, dollars goes to childcare and diapers and, and clothing. And I'm sure that if I were to look at yours, I would be able to see a priority for you as well. And it's important to keep that in mind, that this is personal. But it doesn't necessarily need to be anxiety-filled. If we start with the why and it's relationship-filled, then it's a, a wonderful way to increase connection. Finally, and this is the piece that I want to end on, as I know we only have a few minutes, and I do want to leave a couple minutes left for questions. If you are not currently online, I would highly suggest 
that you get there. For many folks, this is their primary way of giving, especially if you are of um, Generation X or Millennial, either through automatic deduction or online. People can often get very nervous about what, what tool to use. And what I suggest is to focus on user experience and not on the fees. Oftentimes, uh, people will select some, uh, a tool that takes very few, a, a smaller percentage of the fee out of, of each donor's um, pledge. But the person that is using the online tool can get so frustrated that they actually end up giving up. So make sure you, you focus on the person, keeping in mind that this is one more tool for this being a ministry. What do they need to be successful? Start is always better than perfect. It does not need to be perfect for it to be helpful. All right, and these are some examples of some fun things that you can do to bring life to your campaign. All right, in the last couple of minutes, are there additional questions? What I would suggest as a potential easy next is one, determine leadership that's necessary, create some job descriptions, and then think about who is in your parish that has particular skills that would be exciting to, to utilize. And use and start your recruiting if you haven't already. Two, check out Project Resource. They have a lot of templates that are free, and it, it's absolutely a wonderful way in which to get started. Next, establish a year-round calendar for stewardship or annual giving. And then as you're creating that year-round calendar, keep records of your planning for future leadership. That way you are not just building an, a successful plan for this year, but for years to come. Now, change can be hard, and I know that it can be hard. Um, when you're thinking about new ways of doing things, and I like to end with this quote, the new system had met with unrivaled success because of its flexibility, accommodating itself to the diversified wants of the various congregations. This was a particular tool that was introduced with great success, although there was some concern about change. And this comes from 1881 when the first pledge form was created. A great example of how Churches have continued to de de uh, develop new ways of doing things and adapt to what is necessary for their par parishioners to make a pledge. If after this webinar you have additional questions or thoughts, I know that this was a lot of content. I want you to know that we have wonderful folks both on staff and as consultants that are here that can provide additional resources or consulting services in the area of annual giving. And I've uploaded my email as well as our 1-800 number. Please feel free to be in touch. I'm happy to clarify anything that you've heard here tonight or provide additional support. Well, thank you so much, Erin. This was a really wonderful overview of annual giving. Uh, we the end of our webinar, but want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedules to, to be with us tonight for this presentation. We hope this was valuable for your ministry. One last thing I'd like to ask you is that in your uh, email, open up your email, that is, right now, because in there, right at the top of your inbox, is a link to a survey. And we would encourage you just to take a few minutes to please uh, take the survey. Your feedback is so valuable to us. We will share this with Erin. Uh, we will also use this in our planning for our future webinars. So we take this. This is uh, uh, how we uh, produce these webinars. And so just take a few minutes to do that. We'll really appreciate it. Thank you all. We'll uh, hopefully answer a few more of these last questions. But if not, uh, if we have to go, please uh, feel free to contact us either by email or telephone. 
And God bless and Godspeed in your ministry, everyone, and best with your annual giving and stewardship efforts this year and beyond.